So, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the drill and completion session. We have four rooms running in parallel, all with very interesting presentations, and you are free to move between the rooms. At the end of each presentation, there will be a question and answer session. You can make questions during the presentation in the Q&A chat that you can find in the right side of the screen with a question mark icon. As a chairperson of this session, we will have Bruno Levy, GAUP's Head of Drill and Completion, for more than five years, with over 31 years of experience in the oil industry, being more than 10 years in the deep and ultra-deep water drilling and completion operations. Bruno holds a degree, a degree in mathematics and physics. Please welcome Bruno, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia, for the presentation. So welcome to room two. Please stay in room two. This is the best room for the day, so don't go anywhere else, okay? I count on you to, to stay here. But uh, I would like to start uh, this session by uh, welcoming Alessandro Dutra. Uh, Alessandro Dutra is a researcher in Becker Hughes Old Field Equipment, OFE, our the team based in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> He joined the GG uh, Global uh, Research Center in 2012, moved to Baker Hughes in 2018, and has been involved in technology development for energy, aviation, and oil and gas application, with emphasis on monitoring and diagnostics methods. But uh, prior to that, he was a research fellow at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, UFRG, and an officer in the Brazilian Army. He holds an electronics engineer degree from the Military Institute of Engineering, Naimi, and a master degree from URFG, and a PhD degree from uh, Renestler Polytechnic Institute, RPI, both in electrical engineering with emphasis on signal processing. So I would like to welcome Alessandro, who today uh, will present early kick detection and warning system in bracket EKD. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you, Bruno. Okay, so to start, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Gal for putting together this forum and for the opportun opportunity to be here presenting the, the early kick detection program. So as we all know, uh, kicks are always a concern during drilling operations. And of course, we always go into a campaign uh, with the previously prepared plan, right? But uh, nature, however, usually has its own way and sometimes it presents us uh, with additional challenges, right? So she puts operators in uh, situations which are best described by the words of the, the great boxer, Mike Tyson, right? So everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, and it is to try and avoid this punch that uh, Baker Hughes has been developing the technology to detect as early a pro uh, as possible uh, a kick's onset. Okay. So during today pre uh, today's presentation, we shall touch on the following topics. So we are going to briefly review the purpose of the, the early kick detection system. We will discuss its components in a bit more detail. So we shall talk uh, about why they are an important addition to an operator's tool set, what their oper uh, operation uh, working principles are, and the conditions that allow it, uh, they allow the system to work properly. And we are gonna show some uh, test results of the technology that we've been de developing. And of course, at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll show uh, a conceptual design of the, the next phase uh, sub ready prototype, and we'll open up the floor for questions and, and answers. All right, so the question we, like the one question we all continually ask in the energy industry as a whole is how can we do this in the safest possible way, right? And by this, like lots of things can be, right? So uh, this can mean, can this wind farm survive a Cat, cat 5 uh, hurricane? Uh, what are the safer options or the safest options to dispose of nuclear waste, right? 
And in our case, in drilling, uh, how can we make the drilling operator, uh, operations safer? So uh, this has been from the very beginning of the program, the one guiding principle that we've been like striving to, to, to get to. Right? So what we're now gonna do is uh, go into each of the subsystems and see how, how both of them contribute to the overall process safety, right? So first we're gonna start with the annular flow meter and then we'll move on to the two joint locator. In terms of the annular flow meter, right? It would be great if we had a absolute way of measuring uh, the, the return flow of like drilling fluids, like at the very bottom of, of the, the, the well, right? So, but that's not likely to happen. What we have right now is a combination of measurements of uh, pressure uh, that we can use to, to infer somewhat this. And of course, the top side measurements that we make on, uh, uh, once the fluid returns, right? But, uh, uh, what the annular flow meter does is it gives the, the drilling team, right, which already has information such as formation profiles, uh, drilling mud characteristics like composition, density, viscosity. Uh, and of course it knows what the input mud flow rate is, what, what it's pumping down the hole to, to aid in the, the drilling process, right? So it gives them a way of uh, tracking what is happening with the re return mud flow and understand when there, that there is an influx going on or maybe an unforeseen loss of material, right? So uh, in terms of inflows, it will like improve and inflows and losses, of course, but uh, the, that capability of measuring this uh, improves the reaction time of the, the drilling team, which is then able to establish uh, well control faster making it, making the whole operation safer, right? So uh, the value of, the, of having a, a system like this basically, basically goes back to minimizing uh, either the inflow or the loss of fluids and like quicker reaction times, quicker, quicker reaction times that will make the whole life a lot easier for the, the operating team. So what does the annular flow meter do actually, right? So this system, this, this component of the, the, the overall EKG system works by tracking changes in the return flow rate. So we're expecting something and we are seeing changes that are not expected. So what, what are they do uh, to? So the, these measurements, this change measurement is uh, possible because at high pressures, the drilling muds we are considering are like uh, incompressible fluids. And any influxes will produce changes in the flow rate that can be perceived throughout the column, basically in an instantaneous way. So through the annular, we see that proper, like, the propagation of that, that influx almost immediately. And uh, for the, the 3000 meter depth for which the, the system was uh, conceived, that gives the operators, that gives us a considerably, considerable time advantage in dealing with this inflow, right? So the system itself uh, was designed or has been designed to be as simple as possible in terms of adjustments to existing drilling grids. So it's going to be an instrumented regular riser joint, which shall be attached to, to the system as close as possible to the BOP above a flex joint uh, in the region in which the column is uh, um, like subject to a smaller uh, stress, right? So, uh, 
the idea here is that since we, we can follow this, this propagation, we can follow the influx all over the, the column, right? Instead of waiting for the blowout to happen, we can start acting as early as possible to control the event, right? So, and this is possible because given the pressures, whatever gas there is, it's dissolved in the mud, it's not presenting, preventing, uh, presenting a problem in terms of compressibility of the fluid. So this gives us like a, a great advantage, right? In terms of, uh, of uh, working the, the drill uh, operation. How does the system work? So this is what it gives us, but how does it work? So the instrumented riser joint will have a set of uh, 10 ultrasound transducers, right? So we have a ring around the, the spool with 10 ultrasound transducers that will continuously like, send signals into the mud and read back the reflections of that that uh, those signals. So based on that, if we have movement, if we have mud movement, the signals that are going to be read will, will uh, be perceived with a different frequency. So that's the, the Doppler frequency that we are used to when an ambulance goes by. So that's pretty much uh, as easy as it can get in terms of understanding what the system is, is going through uh, when it's working, right? So for each one of those transducers, we build a velocity profile. So on the right here, we have a depiction of what the flow looks like, a quite symmetrical in terms of easy to read uh, uh, flow profile here. And the set of transducers is going to slice this just as it as we slice a cake in, in 10 uh, slices. Uh, here, what we are gonna get is this, like 10 slices of velocity profile, two of which we are showing here in just one plot. So these are uh, diametrically opposed velocity profiles that are actually generated by two different uh, transducers, right? So given that we've uh, read these velocity profiles, the system can now interpolate around the, the, the annulus to give us an estimate of, uh, of what the, the flow rate is, right? And our goal here is to be able to detect changes in flow rate of the order of five gallons per minute uh, over a period of, uh, of over windows of eight to 10 minutes, which are going to give us uh, changes in the order of a barrel, more or less, of influx or loss, right? So again, this is not an, uh, an absolute flow meter, but it's a change, it's a delta flow meter that we're looking forward to, to have here, uh, okay? So in terms of, uh, uh, Prototype results, so we've been running tests with it and uh, we have been able to produce good reproductions, flow rate reproduction results. Uh, of course, being a prototype, we're still looking for ways to improve it before we can qualify a final product, right? But uh, we've been able to, with concentric drill pipes, eccentric drill, drill pipes, uh, different types of mud, water-based, oil-based mud in different weights, nine, 11 and a half, or almost 12 PPG. So we've done tests with it all and gotten results that uh, we have gotten results that are, are getting close to what we, we want to get, right? Uh, so that's one, uh, one part of the system. The other part is what we call a tool joint locator, right? That's the second that's the second subsystem or TJL for, for short. So of course, again, when we go into an operation, uh, a drilling campaign, we, we know the geometry of the, the drill string that we're like putting into the, the well. 
uh, but to track that geometry 3,000 plus meters uh, down into the, the sea uh, is certainly not an easy feat, right? So to avoid uh, uh, blindly performing operations such as hanging the drill pipe in, in the event of wanting to shut down the, 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 the BOP, shut, shut the ram, the act on the rams, right? Uh, the TJL gives us this information much closer to the BOP. So that gives the operator like a much more accurate way of knowing where the two joints are. And therefore it gives him a lot more confidence in acting on the system, right? So how does it work? So it's again, a very simple process. Uh, we have a, like a huge piece of metal going into the, the, the column, right? The, the drill pipe. And that drill pipe has certain, uh, certain instances in which it has a varying diameter. Uh, so whenever that diameter changes, we can actually measure that by using a set of uh, electromagnetic sensors. So we keep continuously pulsing, uh, like transmitting an ele electromagnetic field inside the, the, the column. And by using a couple more sensors, we can actually detect whenever there are deformations to that field. So the two joint senses that passage, it tracks, uh, it can infer whenever the diameter is enlarging or it's uh, diminishing. Right, so it basically gives us a way to, to see the, the two joints. And since we have more than, one, uh, more than one detecting sensor, it actually tells us also whether the drill string is going in or out of the, of the, the well, right? If it's moving down the well or back up. So in terms of test results, uh, you can see like the plot on, on the left, the plot on the left shows like multiple passes of five two joints uh, in and out of the, of the sensor, right? At different rates of penetration and, and retraction, right? giving us an ability to actually see what's going on. So that, since we already know the geometry in advance, will give the operator like a much easier time doing this. Whatever uh, actions he have to take on, uh, he might have to take on the, the BOP, will be a much better informed actions that we, he will perform. Right. So, and in terms of accuracy, we we are down to to uh, an accuracy deviation in the range of plus or minus 15 centimeters whenever, in terms of location, up or down, whenever the, the two joints is approaching the system. So it's certainly a much better idea, gives a, a, the operator a much better idea of what's going on whenever he needs to, to perform, let's say, the, like the hanging. Now it's not completely blind anymore. It's a much more, uh, much better informed uh, op operation that he, is able to do, right? So, uh, of course, so we are still in, uh, in development as well, but uh, like this is an example of, uh, of uh, an interface that might be presented to the, to the, to the operator in which he would, like the, the geometry of the BOP and the RAMs would be informed in advance uh, for the, a particular, for a given, uh, uh, drilling column or, or drilling riser that is used, right? And uh, the passage of the two joints will be shown like in real time to the operator. So it's gonna give him a visual aid to again, uh, understand what's going on and, and be able to properly act on the, on the BOP ramps, right? Okay. and. What are next steps in our development? So we've 
come to a point where now uh, the electronics and the, the, the mechanical designs are in place to produce a subsea ready prototype. So that subsea ready prototype will be like will consist uh, of three pieces actually one which is the actual system so here all the electronics all the sensors are going to be embedded and that is a piece that's going to be attached to a couple of configurable crossovers that can be tailor-made to fit any type of riser column that's being used on whatever rig we have out there in the world, right? So uh, it's uh, what we call an, uh, a vendor agnostic design that can be used not only on Baker Hughes rigs, Baker Hughes like uh, supplied rigs, but other uh, suppliers as well. So just by changing those crossovers, we'll be able to, to deploy this system anywhere, right? So, that basically is the, what I would like to share with you today here. Uh, Bruno, uh, if you'd like, I, I'm ready for whatever Q&A we have uh, for today. So thank you very much for the introduction and for the time to, to present the, our program here. Alexander, thank you so much for, for this great presentation, and uh, I think it's a great technology, the technology of the future. Um, Natalia, do, do we have any questions from, from the room? By the way, Alexander, just for information, we have about 50 people in the room, okay, so okay. we are completely blind. I didn't know how to ask, but <laughs> I think, I think I it's totally a good assistance so far. <laughs> It's a good assistance, so I think there's, uh, there's quite a few people attending your presentation, which, which is great. Uh, thank Natalia, you, you. any question from the room? No, no question. Okay, so if, uh, if there is no question, I have a, a few questions. So first, uh, for, for the tool joint detector or locator, where is exactly the sensor? Is it around the, the, the pipe ramps itself? And, uh, uh, it's around, it's uh, close to the inner wall of the, the column, but within the, uh, let me see, can you see? Yeah, we can see, uh, the, still see the presentation. Okay, so yeah. this is actually the inner part of the, of the column, right? So the, we have three, uh, three electromagnetic coils, like three antennas, basically, one transmitting, okay. two receiving. And they are like attached to the attached, but they are covered by a a sleeve, right, to pr protect them, but towards the inside of the column. So you have here the the wall, the column wall, the the, the spool wall, and then you have the column, and you're gonna have a a lining here to protect the the coils, basically. Okay. Okay. So which kind of uh, delta OD uh, your sensor are precise in matter? For example, okay, a five inch drill pad, I think it's I got uh, close to six of its uh, tool joint. So the, the, the delta is quite big, but what about if we run tubing or, or near flush joints? So what would be the accuracy about uh, being, being able to read uh, the, the tool joint or to detect the tool joint? Uh... Yeah, that's a very good question, Bruno. I, I don't have the, the smaller numbers here. Uh, we've been doing tests. Uh, let me see. The, the one test we did was about three quarters of an inch, the, 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 the most recent test we ran, and that was detected uh, okay, no problem okay. at all. So, okay. And even okay. with a higher standard of protection, that was actually the, the purpose of the most recent test that we did. Okay. So uh, we're confident that it's gonna be, be like useful for, the, for the, the, the industry as a whole. So. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, 
I have also one one question on the, the frometer. Uh, how are you dealing with uh, the the temperature? And if you if you don't have a flat rate OG across the well with uh, with <coughs> high temperature, for example, at the bottom, and then close to sea bed, you have maybe a four degrees Celsius. Um, do do you, are you working with some algorithm to to uh, to look at the real flow rate that's coming from the bottom being much lighter, or you have the the instant T flow rate at this depth at this temperature? Yeah, we we have the the flow rates that we're not since we're working with delta with changes in the flow rate, right? So we're not like. Uh, much concerned with that. It's not a big concern because we understand what's going in, right? And we know what to expect from coming out. So that those changes, since they are on a constant basis, like close to the hole, like close to the well, uh, they already give us the indication we need in terms of uh, of delta flow. So okay. uh, it's it's it's. Uh, understandable, but it's uh, it's not a, a huge concern for for the for the okay. what purpose we have for the operation that we expect. Okay, okay, okay. I have another three minutes if if I can see, so I don't want to delay any any more the second uh, presenter. But in matter of TRLs, you see every project has a TRL, TRL one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So if you are on the prototype uh, point where you're ready to run it, you saw you are at TRL 6 or something? To run it, you saw you are at TRL 6 or something like that? Uh, no, we were a little like prior to that, probably 4 or 5, because uh, we still need to qualify the, uh, ah. the spool itself and before, like prior to going into a, a sub-sea test, right? So it's, uh, it's a step before that. Okay. But we're getting closer, so... Okay. That's a good thing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Alessandro, thank you so much. I'm not sure. I don't see. I'm looking at the screen around me. I don't see any more questions from the room. So thank you very much for your time and your presentation you. and the great technology. And uh, who knows? I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm getting old, but I hope to see that in, in my career in a few years. So. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for okay. your time. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Have a good day and stay safe. Thank you, you so too. much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see one person in front of me. I think it's Mr. Darag Flanagan, if I pronounce the name correctly. That was uh, perfect. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay, Natalia, can we move on with the second topic? Yes, please. Okay, okay, thank you so much, uh, Natalia. Okay, so now uh, we are moving to our uh, second speaker of uh, of uh, this uh, great journey this afternoon. Um, we we talk about uh, well activation with nitrogen assisted kickoff using trojan simulation. Um, this presentation will be performed by Darak Flanagan, and uh, Darak Flanagan is the Orga project champion based in Norway. Uh, he joined Schumerger in 2004. He spent the, the first 10 years in production operation working on projects in the North Sea and Africa. He then spent some time in the Middle East as a petroleum engineer consultant in both upstream and LNG side before returning to the UK. Since then, he has uh, had various roles in business development, project, and uh, group management across Europe, and he holds a Bachelor of and with Honours in Petroleum Geology from the University of Aberdeen in the UK. Please welcome Derek Flanagan presenting well activation with nitrogen assisted kickoff using transient simulation. Thank you and uh, welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the very uh, uh, nice uh, introduction. Um, so yes, firstly, a uh, good day to you all. Uh, I'm currently in uh, sunny Scotland. Um, I trust everyone's keeping well in these uh, interesting times, uh, and I'd like to take uh, 
take the opportunity to thank the team at GALP uh, for the invitation to present uh, at this open day. It's a real pleasure, a pleasure to be here. So as for the introduction, my name is Dara Flanagan. I'm, I'm uh, the product champion for Olga here in uh, the Slumberger's Flow Assurance portfolio. Um, and today I'm going to take you through a case relating to um, well activation um, with nitrogen assisted kickoff using transient simulation. So first, uh, I'll go through a very short agenda here, but uh, first uh, I'll take you through some background on the techniques that we are using here um, to set the scene. I'll then highlight uh, the problem statement and the challenge which this solution addresses, um, followed by a case example and some closing remarks. So I, I hope you enjoy the, the presentation, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of this, uh, this short talk. So nitrogen kickoff uh, is, is a means uh, to reactivate a well that is unable to restart under natural conditions. So following workovers on wells with, with high water cuts, for example, it's a commonly used technique to restart, to restart the well when the circumstances dictate. So a coil tubing unit is typically used to insert the, the tubing into the well. And there's a picture in the top right. Um, which is one of our uh, onshore units. And the picture in the bottom uh, right illustrate how this works in practice. Nitrogen is injected um, into the well to displace, to displace fluid. This in turn reduces the hydrostatic pressure created by this uh, fluid column and assists in overcoming this right, and, and bringing the well hopefully back on stream. So coal tubing operations are quite complex, both in terms of the practice and in the field and, and to simulate. Um, so when the coil is inserted um, or attracted from the well, the annular length um, changes, which in turn results in temporal um, displacements of, of fluids. And this, of course, varies across um, the length of the job. Um, gas in this case, Nitrogen is, is typically uh, injected while running in hole to minimize the non-productive time. And after the target depth is achieved, um, it, uh, you have the, and has the required impact uh, on the pressure differentials. Um, and then owing to changes uh, in fluid properties and with time, these jobs are in a, a transient state um, and need to be planned carefully. If you inject too high uh, a rate, this can derive in too high uh, friction losses. You effectively form a, a, a cushion of nitrogen in the well bore, preventing the formation of fluids from entering, uh, entering the well bore. If you inject too low, um, this may provide insufficient lift. Um, both of these outcomes result in, in extended job times, potentially excessive use of, of nitrogen, and in the worst case scenarios, of course, you, you don't provide enough lift um, to the fluid to allow the well to flow. So what's the problem statement here and ultimately the goal? Um, my last two slides, I think, hopefully described the mechanism and gave you some indications um, why careful planning is important as part of a successful nitrogen lift. So firstly, you know, mobilizing these, these cold tubing units is expensive. Um, especially in an offshore environment. Failed kickoffs result in increased non-productive time, operational expenditure, and deferred production while the, remain, um, you know, the well remains um, unable to flow. So to increase the chance of success, you can apply dynamic modeling uh, to design and optimize the operation. And by using this technique, it allows us to reduce the uncertainty, which is inherent to the subsurface in many ways, relating to uh, the injection volumes, the optimal depths surrounding the coil, and the best uh, well parameters to get the optimal result. So the following here represent uh, some of the challenges and typical questions which we seek to answer during, during the planning phase, and where transient simulation can assist. So, you know, do I have the required amount of nitrogen? Too much is suboptimal. Um, on the commercial manager's balance sheet, right? But too little may impact um, the technical success of the job. 
does my tubing unit have enough length to reach the required depth? Now, this decision is particularly important in, in offshore environments where rig space and, and supply may not be so readily available. And then the last two points, here the last two queries relating to, to lifting campaigns, you can take in a, in a broader sense where a number of wells are, are looking to be reactivated. And the order in which you bring these on to get your best producers back on as a priority, for example, can, can save significant uh, MPT. So the aim is quite simple, right? It's we want to minimize operational expenditure and non-productive time. We want to maximize the return on in the, the investment in the job and minimize um, deferred production or production losses. So that set the scene, I hope. Um, I'd now like you to take you through the case study demonstrating uh, our solution. So the case itself is from a, a, an offshore well in the North Sea. Um, a workover was performed on the well, and, and uh, following the workover, the, the, this well in question, you know, it was unable to restart under natural flow. So a cold tubing unit was mobilised, um, but the operation um, to restart the well using a nitrogen kickoff was was unsuccessful. Um, the details here provide an overview of the well in question. It's a horizontal well um, with around it's around 8,000 feet TVD and with a, a 3,000 foot approximately 3,000 foot horizontal section. The reservoir pressure is 3,600 psig and the reservoir pressure is uh, 350 degrees Fahrenheit at, at the surface. So this plot, again, I appreciate the scales, a little, um, perhaps a little small on the side here, but not to worry, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this as I go. Um, this plot shows the behavior of the, from the operation. The blue line here is the depth of the, the coil tubing. The green line is the oil rate from the well. And then the red line is the, the nitrogen injection rate. And along the x-axis here, we have time in, in hours. So after five hours, the topside choke was opened and the well, while it, there is some flow to surface from the well bore, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't flow. Um, cold tubing is fed into a depth of around 6,000 feet and at 10 hours into the operation, we started to inject uh, nitrogen at 420 uh, scuffs per second. Um, after 15 hours, um, we stopped the injection and retracted the cold tubing. And you'll see from the initial uh, injection, it brings some production to surface, but ultimately uh, the well fails to restart under, under natural flowing conditions, as you can see uh, as we move to the right of this plot. <clears throat> so from discussions with uh, the customer and, and the cold tubing team and also our flow assurance experts, we propose the following way forward use Olga Transient Flow Simulator, in this case, to model the case using the input param um, parameters from the field, and then run different sensitivities on the well parameters to come up with possible reattempt um, scenarios. So as part of this exercise, we, we actually modeled numerous scenarios. Um, but today I'm going to present three. The first is a replication of the field, uh, the failed um, field attempt which we can treat effectively as a, as a baseline. And then two different scenarios um, to demonstrate the workflow and ultimately um, the scenario which was recommended um, to the field. So I guess before I go into the, the, the case uh, scenarios, um, a quick word on Olga for those perhaps unfamiliar with, with what it is. Um, so Olga um, simulates transient flow scenarios, uh, modeling conditions which change over time as opposed to steady state operations. So Olga, uh, I mean, Olga's widely used in the, in the market to understand transient phenomenon in wells and pipelines across, uh, across the life cycle, actually, of the oil field um, from design through to decommissioning. Um, it's also used in operations to support activities such as the case I'm presenting here today. So it models um, three phases, gas, liquid, solids, and in this case, it's a good solution because uh, it allows us to, with the moving grid capability that there is in Olga, it allows us to actually model the movement of the cold tubing um, through the wellbore 
and therefore um, it gives us a, a, an accurate physical model of the phenomenon that we, are, we witness in the field. So on to the scenario. So the first scenario I'll present here is our baseline model, where we input the well parameters from the failed kickoff attempt to emulate um, this in our model. So on the left, you can see the timeline and, and the input parameters which were used. And on the right, you'll see uh, the results from the OGA, the OGA model. So the top graph is the top size choke position, zero off, and, and obviously one being open. Um, then we have the cold tubing depth, the gas injection rate, in this case nitrogen, and the bottom graph shows our, our oil, um, oil production. And then this diagram you see on the right is actually a snapshot from the simulation in OGA. Um, which shows brown, which is, is oil, and water, which is, is liquid. White is, is gas in the well bore. Um, so it should be noted that you know, this is just a, a snapshot from the model near the end of the simulation run. And this is just to highlight the overall results across that time frame. Um, but I'll describe some of the, the, the phenomenon we witnessed through the simulation through the, as I described this. So, as in the attempt in the field for the first five hours um, simulation, the well is shut in. Uh, and after five hours, we opened the well had, uh, well had choke. We see the, a small surge of liquid um, is produced, but the, un, uh, the well is effectively unable to restart. So at eight hours, uh, we start to inject, we start to insert the cold tubing, and at 10 hours, we, we, we start to inject nitrogen. Um, we see how the liquids are produced in the model along with uh, the injected nitrogen into the, into the well bore. Um, so after five hours of, uh, five and a half hours of injection, uh, the wellhead choke is then closed and the cold tubing uh, retracts. The well is left shut in for a further nine and a half hours until we try to restart the well at the 25 hour uh, time mark. Um, and when the choke opens, we see a reaction in, in the well bore, but we see that the well does not is not able to start up. So what this model provided us with was, was a, a very good match of what happened in the field, in the failed attempt. And so it gave us confidence that the model was able to, to, to replicate the field behavior. And indeed, it gave us a solid basis to work for, for trying out some uh, different uh, sensitivity. So after the failed scenario, we, we took a look at what seemed like the best next natural step, which is to see if injecting more nitrogen would help to restart. So in this scenario, we, we, we keep all the other um, input parameters constant, but we varied um, uh, the injection time, uh, adding another two hours effectively to the injection period. Um, and I'll describe what we saw uh, during the, the simulation. So as with before, for the first five hours, with the well shut in. After that, we open the choke, cold tubings uh, inserted into the well, and we start to inject nitrogen at, at 10 hours. Um, so after seven and a half hours of injection, the wellhead choke is closed, and then the cold tubing is, is retracted. The well is then left for a, a further seven and a half hours until the 25 hour mark, as you can see on the timeline. And you'll notice in the lower uh, this illustrates the oil production, not the total liquid um, production. We see some initial surges um, in the well before the, f the, the flow eventually starts to stabilize. Um, and if you look at the snapshot of, of the Olga simulation at that time, you can, you can see the, the, um, the continuous flow of fluids, um, both oil and, and water, um, to the surface. So th this model showed what uh, you know, a, a successful restart based on the parameters that we input. So the previous scenario, uh, I showed, you know, injecting for a further two hours, um, and it was able to reactivate the well in, in the model. But, you know, this required a significant amount of, of nitrogen in addition to the first attempt, and uh, roughly 30% additional nitrogen injected. So another possible scenario that we we, we, we looked at was to see whether injecting at a deeper point in the well bore would help facilitate the restart without, uh, with, with using uh, you know, less nitrogen. 
So in this uh, scenario, we, we uh, assume that we have access to around 7,000 feet of, of tubing instead, and we investigated if that deeper injection point will help to restart the well, with all other parameters being constant. So again, I, I won't go through the, the initiation because that doesn't uh, vary from the previous two scenarios. But um, yeah, we, we went deeper with the cold tubing. Um, the 10 hour mark, we inject nitrogen. Um, after five and a half hours of nitrogen injection, we closed the choke, retracted the, the cold tubing. Um, the well was then sh left shut in until 25 hours, uh, total job time. And you can see, again, we get some initial surges before the flow stabilizes, but we also found in this scenario, as with the previous one, that the model indicated that we'd be able to successfully restart the well with, um, with these uh, parameters. So, <clears throat> so we took this rep recommendations to the field um, in, a, in an attempt to restart this case. Um, in the end, the decision was taken um, to attempt an extended injection period. So while this required further uh, additional nitrogen, it was deemed the most practical owing to the limitation on the length of cold tubing available, um, which made the results from scenario three, while looked promising, it wasn't practical. In the field. So as before, uh, you see the cold tubing depth in, in blue, all rated in green here, and, and the nitrogen injection rate in, in, uh, in red. Um, we see here the production surge after 25 hours, and we also witness some unstable flow in the model around time, but ultimately um, the well was able to successfully uh, flow, reaching stable conditions towards the right-hand side of this chart, which is uh, around 36 to 38 uh, hours into the, into the operation. Okay, so in summary, um, uh, the results of this simulation, we, we provided uh, more than one proposed solution to successfully attempt to kick off of the well. Um, and giving options around the other constraints offshore, such as the capacity of nitrogen available and, and the cold tubing length, um, it, it gave us some practical approaches to trying to solve this. Um, for the second point, um, we should remind ourselves there's always an element of uncertainty in the subsurface. Um, this is inherent to our industry, right? Um, and from a data point of view, while being able to model that failed kickoff attempt as, as a baseline for our, our, our other scenarios, while that did helped to reduce the uncertainty because it gave us that additional confidence that the model was accurately representing what was what was going on and provide us associated insight. Um, it's not essential um, in order to have that baseline. Uh, this solution can be applied as part of an overall pre-planning, uh, pre-kickoff attempt as, as a practical step to assist in avoiding failed kickoff attempts uh, and associated downtime in the, in the first place. In terms of value, as mentioned, we modeled a number of scenarios. We took two optimized and successful scenarios from the model to, to the field to select. Um, and I think the overall result uh, demonstrated the importance of investing what is uh, minimal time and cost up front as part of a, a, you know, a robust planning process with the ultimate aim to reduce non-productive time and optimize the costs. And last but not least, of course, bring production back. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and I um, hope you enjoyed my short talk. Dara, yes, thank you very much. And your right on spot is, is 15.49. So you, you use your 20 minutes really, really appropriately. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, to be honest with you, as you could maybe listen, oh no, you went not there in the direction, but I'm the, the drilling completion manager, so you could understand that uh, the Olga is not, I'm not dealing with Olga on a daily basis, but I hope we have people in the room that are from Frontiers. I heard uh, <clears throat> time to time people using Olga. I think uh, we have the Olga license at Galp. And I know that people from Frontiers are using Olga, maybe for another purpose uh, from, from this one. But 
on a very humble manner, if there is no question from the room, um, I have a free question for you. Maybe some of them are relevant, maybe some of them are not. But do you know if Olga can also uh, simulate uh, if we have uh, a gas diff uh, mandrel in the well? Uh, does the software also can simulate uh, nitrogen injection or through the umbilical or through even the same uh, uh, injection, uh, gas, uh, gas diff uh, valve? And, and for how much time? Do you have also this capability? Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of applications which Olga is, is used for in the wells, uh, whether it's to support artificial lift, albeit uh, gas lift, or you know, modeling the behavior of an ESP pump, for example. Uh, so there's a number of applications where the, the physics behind Olga assists both in planning the design of these, uh, but also then uh, into operations to actually use a model such as Olga to to be tied to real-time information coming from the field. So the aim there is obviously to give you a bit of a look ahead with the model of what's happening and, and allow you to hopefully avoid any uh, trips, for example, or, or to optimize production overall. Um, okay. But you know, Olga is used in some drilling applications as well. Uh, okay. The engine, yes, and uh, so there is some, again, the engine behind Olga can be, uh, is, is used for, uh, underlies some of the other things we do across across a number of domains, uh, such as uh, blowout and kill prevention modeling and so on as well. So, so not too far from your uh, original domain, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Fantastic. You said well control modeling, huh? That's what you said, huh, for drilling? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, very good. I didn't know. So you see we're running uh, every day. No, uh, uh, I would like to understand uh, about the algorithm. Is it um, when you say, oh, okay, let's try maybe 7,000 foot or let's try 17 hours instead of 15? Uh, is it a kind of Monte Carlo simulation and you say you put a round and you have alteration? Okay, uh, let me give, let, let, let calculate with the rounds of uh, from 12 hours to 20 hours and then it will give me the best shot about uh, the, what, what is the, the best potential hours to get the prediction back, and same thing for, for the depth, or uh, what is behind the scene, I mean, uh, to, to achieve this uh, this achievement you just uh, show us? Yeah, so obviously I, I only presented three scenarios here, you know, the replication of the failed attempt and then two successful uh, model attempts. Uh, there's obviously, we, there was a number of different sensitivities using a range uh, a range on the parameters that are available to us, including depth of the cold tubing, uh, you know, the, the nitrogen injection rate, but also we, we tried some sensitivities on different well parameters, such as, you know, opening and closing chokes at different times and so on. So the model, yeah, the, 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 the idea, I guess, with running those initial sensitivities with those ranges is to hone the expertise and the experts into what might be successful solutions. And then it's those... Um, scenarios that really you need that combination of a model, but also flow assurance expertise um, to evaluate sure. them, right? Uh, sure. So do you have any, any case of uh, a deep water case where you have been successful? And, and also the, also with that, talking about deep water, can you also manage uh, code tubing taper string? Because of course in deep water, so you want maybe uh, use taper string to be lighter as, as, as much as possible. So can you handle also those cases, taper string, deep water? I mean, from a physics point of view, there there isn't a, an issue there. I'm not I'm not specifically aware of any uh, cases. Uh, I'm I'm more Europe uh, centric, so I'm not aware off the top of my head of, of any uh, uh, deep water cases. This is something we've been doing and and kind of championing in. Uh, in the North Sea, amongst other places, but um, I, I can certainly uh, have a look and, and, and come back if there's interest on some some wider, uh, some more cases on this topic. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert again, but I think we may have some application, but uh, I don't think it's a dialogue with the room, so I'm not sure if the people can intervene from the room. Uh, I don't think so. But uh, as you know, we have, uh, we're uh, involved in the major field, uh, a pre sort field in, in Brazil, and uh, for example, if we have a shutdown, even if those well are, are very uh, vigorous, 
some time after a shutdown or FPA. So some of the well may have some difficulties to come back up. And uh, so this could be potentially a solution to look at. And uh, so, like I say, all through uh, cold tubing or if uh, some wells have uh, uh, gas leaf valve, so maybe through the gas leaf valve or through the umbilical. So I, I can foresee maybe potential application in, in our uh, business, in our portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly we'd always, uh, you know, recommend investing uh, that time up front as part of the planning process to help uh, to help avoid any surprises in the field. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, I I, I got a question here. I will uh, I will read for you. In uh, so the question is: In the second scenario, the extra time needed is function of the injected gas specific gravity? Question mark. If natural gas in, is injected, maybe the 5.5 hours injection could kick off of the well? Question mark. That's a very good question, and and yes, that's that's a very. Uh... Uh, uh, good topic. I guess uh, you know, as part of the screening on the sensitivities here, we were working uh, within the supply that we had uh, offshore. Um, so we had nitrogen to play with, but uh, as, again, as far as I understand, that that wasn't necessarily an option in the case. But no, the question is very valid, um, and it may have allowed this this well to flow sooner. But uh, um, this is just a, an example. Uh, yeah. So you can do the simulation or with any kind of fluid. Well, of course, gas or natural gas or yes. but not naturally with everything light, let's say. Yeah, and and I think uh, again, there's there's lots of different inputs and things we could have tried here, and this is just a an example of of uh, one uh, one scenario. So yeah, very valid okay. point, and thank you. Okay, I'm just thinking, Lord, here, but uh, can you do that also with a foam system? Uh, foam's a bit more tricky uh, for us to uh, to model. We, uh, it's a combination of services that we have in Slumberger anyway that we would use uh, to to look at foam. So um, Olga can model the the liquid loading itself, um, and then we work with our our friends in MI uh, MI SWAC to 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 do that as a combined service. Um, to see what the impact of you know injecting uh, of, of what the impact in the whale ball will be of a, of a foam operation, and we have okay. some cases of where we've done that successfully, combining some Olga consulting with with uh, some services from MI Swaco, um, mm. focus mm. particularly yeah specifically for liquid loaded wells. Right? Okay. Very good. Okay, I'm looking at my screen. I don't see any other questions. So, Darag, I would like to thank you very much for your very valuable time and great technology and apparently the the the, the proof value of Olga. <laughs> so, I'm sure uh, there are some people in 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 this room in this <coughs> virtual room would be interested also to do some simulation about uh, potential application for for us in our portfolio. Derek, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you a, a great day. Stay safe. And thank you again for participating to the 7 uh, Gallup Engineering Open Day and with uh, this, great, uh, this great presentation. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Stay for the safe. Time. Much appreciated. You too. Uh, same for me. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, we, we are right on schedule. Uh, it's 15.59, so I'm very proud of myself. I'm one minute ahead of time. And uh, so I, I'm perfect uh, to present our next speaker, which is also a, a Schumberger uh, employee individual. So we have a great amount of uh, Schumberger in this room today. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, Vladimir. Uh, I'm, I will try to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Vladimir Vmemat Vienma. Um, did, did I did that correctly or? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I will try. No I will try. I will try to do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, Vladimir will present uh, something very, very uh, actual, and that uh, is very also on top of our action in GAP is about digitalization. So basically, uh, his presentation will be. Uh, uh, Innovative digital reconstruction planning solution 
effectively enable off-site collaboration in currency. It's a very long title, but uh, first of all, I would like to introduce very briefly uh, Mr. Zemet. Uh, so Mr. Zemet is already from Venezuela. So, bienvenido, buenas tardes. Uh, and holds, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Zemet holds uh, a petroleum engineering degree and with experience in both operator and service companies. He has been involved in drilling, completion, completion survey, and walkover operation from the planning to the execution phases, so through the entire cycle, in several countries across America, Europe, Africa, Asia. So you probably done all, all of the con continent. Huh? Is, is maybe at Antarctic Oceania is missing, Atlantic. Huh? But uh, it's already <laughs> it's currently the drilling BDM for the Eastern, uh, Eastern Hemisphere in charge of all shumers doing digital technologies with particular focus on new digital web construction solution. So I would like the room to welcome Mr. Vladimir Zemar Zelma, and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation and welcome uh, to uh, room number two uh, to this uh, drilling completion uh, task. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much again for the invite and the warm welcome. Uh, just to confirm, can you see the screen and the slides? We can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, as the title says, uh, sorry, uh, I will actually discuss today and introduce you to our new uh, digital well construction solution. This is covering everything related to the well construction planning, drilling, completions, uh, planning stages. And uh, let me walk you through and why we have uh, developed this and what this is about. So first of all, the question on why we needed a next generation for digital planning, what this is all about and what it is really the requirement behind this. First of all, uh, as we know, traditionally speaking, the solutions that we're using today are mainly standalone um, solutions that have been installed on our computers or any server that we can access remotely, but still every single module is pretty much independent and disconnected between each other. So once you do the trajectory design, for example, uh, you have to bring the data manually for the completion design, for the casing design, and etc. <clears throat> so for that uh, particular purpose, uh, we needed to have an improved well quality, well design quality, uh, keeping the data consistent end to end. So um, if someone changes anything throughout the planning process, every single other individual will actually get access to that latest version of the data on a seamlessly manner. This means it facilitates the collaboration between the different teams, the different uh, parties. And when you consider this, and I would try to give you an example at the end, on uh, the current situation with people working from home, like I am just now, uh, and you can see it on my back, uh, you know, it is difficult to actually share, to actually collaborate. And, and however, the digital technology that we have today enables that collaboration. It also encourages the standardization, as you can enforce the system to actually comply with your specific requirements and standards at any given time or at all times. Uh, as a default, the system has been built to consider ISO, APIs, and NORSOC standards, all three together, all combined and keeping the best or the most stricter ones uh, for the different aspects and elements that have to be uh, defined and designed. Better decision making, for sure, once we have all data combined, and we're talking about big data analytics, machine learning recognition algorithms, we are then utilizing our time to create better decisions and to make better designs. At the end, what we want to achieve is the reduction of the uh, MPT, operationally speaking, and to enhance the quality of the wells throughout the cycle of the well itself. For this, uh, this is taking us to the increase of the efficiency, which of course is related to the specific aspect on uh, the utilization of the resources that we have in the office to create better plans. And at the end, the transparency and automation, which it's uh, pretty much interrelated to everything else that I just mentioned briefly. So um, the solution, and I will try to walk you through on what this is about and how this is looking like. So when you open the solution at its, uh, a brand new technology, it is actually full cloud deployed. You have to install absolutely nothing on your computer. And as a matter of fact, you can even access it from your mobile. 
Once you open your internet browser, that's everything you need, internet connectivity and a browser, this is what you see. You have a dashboard with all the wells that you are assigned to in the planning process. On the bottom left corner, the tasks that are specific to you as an engineer, as a manager, as a supervisor or superintendent. And on the right side, you have the reviews and approve because we have also enabled the, capa the, the capability and capacity to actually review and approve different elements or the overall project plan. Once you go inside the solution, you see the team management board, and here you can define who get access to what. In particular, when it comes to specific elements like the AFE, which is something that is very uh, reserved to the operator, in this case, uh, Gallup, uh, to ensure that service providers like me, Slombergy, or any other can get access to the full details on the contracts that are not pertaining to us. So that is one of the uh, user management rights that we have enabled in the system. Moreover, you can see who from the team member have full access, restricted access, but more importantly, who are the defined reviewers and approvers to any of the individual tasks that comprise the well planning process. You can change and modify this at any time. And of course, if any of the team members is going on holidays or for whatsoever reason is unable to connect, the system automatically flags that something is pending and someone uh, else from the team can actually pick up that particular element or task. Moving into the tasks, what we have defined here is, as I said, is a fully interconnected solution. This means each one of these boxes is a specific placeholder for one of the other activities. Again, planning of the trajectory, the wellboard geometry, the casing design, the kick tolerance, the completion design, or many others. If you pay attention to what the boxes are on the top, it's uh, on a section called subsurface and surface. And that is, again, just a split in that particular uh, process or manner, just because we wanted to show it this way. This is fully customizable and can fully resemble your gate decision process throughout the planning stages. However, what I want you to show uh, is to um, pay attention to the boxes that we have here related to the uh, subsurface elements, which are not training the drilling engineers or the completion engineers. With that, we have then enabled a placeholder for the other teams to actually share data, collaborate with the uh, subsurface, with, sorry, with the drilling department, and to ensure that the coherence is kept end-to-end -end, uh, from the early stages of the trajectory design, which is normally done by the subsurface team, or the definition of the, um, the formation tops, which are quite relevant when it comes to geomechanical analysis, even the geomechanical analysis per se, the 1D or the 3D MEM models, formation temperatures, targets, horizons, folds, and layers. All these data is not really something that the drilling engineer will actually modify, but it's something that really uh, brings value and uh, information for better designing these new wells. When you actually then combine all this, uh, as I said at the beginning, with um, big data analytics, for example, we are combining the system seamlessly and digitally to the DDR database, daily drilling reports. With that, we are now able to bring the observed well data, the codes for the activities, and more importantly, the MPT recorded activities from your previous experience to the new well planning. Why would we want to do that? Well, very simple. On a one-click manner, uh, you can get access to the data, as you can see here in the screen, but the importance is that every single bullet uh, on the middle plot that you have there in the screen represents one of the recorded MPTs on your previous operations. If you decide to bring that specific MPT as a risk to your new planning, you just hover your mouse on top and copy to your new well. What this system is doing on the back is that the time that has been accrued as that MPT will then be factored as part of a Monte Carlo analysis that runs in real time to your full activity uh, planner, and therefore due to the time versus depth curve. With that, what we want to go out from is the standard template and best guess estimate from the drifting engineer saying, we will drill this section in two days, and we will be able to then cement and uh, drill the shoe in another day, and so on, so on. We want to stop that practice. We want to actually utilize the historical data that exists throughout our portfolios and even around the world 
in many cases either uh, internally for the specific operators or as a public source database uh, to then better design and make the proper analysis in terms of how long will it take us to drill that well because at the end that is fully interrelated to the AFE. On the far right side you have the specific attributes that goes with that uh, a specific MPT or risk element to your new well. You can select or deselect as you believe uh, it's appropriate. So again, we are not really substituting the drilling engineer. We're just giving them more capabilities to better design the wells. Uh, and then you have some attributes to then define how this will be computed as part of the Monte Carlo analysis. On the automated validation, we have also embedded different uh, algorithms that goes, again, as per standards in the industry. So for the case, casing integrity and uh, axial, biaxial, and triaxial analysis, this is a standard for everyone. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, everybody will look at the same plots. The only thing that changes are the load analysis that are specific to either the operator or to the location where the well will be drilled. However, for those calculations, once you have preset up the casing loads or the completion load analysis, the system will automatically run, as you can see in the bottom, very simple traffic light system, green, everything is okay with a check mark, yellow, warning, you may have something to double check or to revise, or the X in red, you have a failure in that particular element, and then you have to actually change it. If you hoover over the mouse again, the system will give you hints and insights on what to change. And again, everything is based on these uh, machine learning algorithms and embedded practices that resides within the solution. More importantly, you have also a, a full view, an overview of your well planning. It's not only about the casing, the trajectory, the completion, the testing, the kick tolerance in every uh, individual, as an individual piece. Everything is combined, everything is part of one single project, one single well, and you can have a full overview here on all the elements and how the engineering analysis is going through all that process. You can bring even the data from the service contractors, like for example, Slombage, DNM on the VHA design. Uh, nothing uh, really that it's uh, an analysis that is not normally done by the operator, but by the service providers. Still, you can bring that into the context of the well planning, and you can see then hook load analysis, surface torque, stress, buckling, and other parameters that are really relevant to the design of the well, because then it will have an impact over the quality of the bore or the full completion uh, later on. If we go then and take the design itself, the automated design capabilities, and an exact survey that as part of what we want to achieve, different versions of every single element have been kept. That means if someone changes the trajectory, you have version one, version two, that affects the case in design and kick tolerance and derive a version two, version three, or version four of the same. If someone wants to go back in time and change the parameters or bring back the parameters on the version one, you can always rewind, you can go back, you can move forward. Uh, more importantly, what we want to do is to ensure that it doesn't matter if someone made a mistake, nothing will be lost, everything will reside within the system, and you will be able to always go back and revise what has been done or why a specific design criteria was actually disregarded and move on into a new design. So you have a draft version and share version, which is then for the linear uh, design of the well. Combining this uh, solution with subsurface models, as I was saying before, for example, the trajectory in the context of the surfaces, the horizons, the folds, and the layers brings a lot of data and added, uh, added value to the drilling engineer. Here you can see on a very simple 3D uh, render view, the trajectory in the context of the observed wells, you will be able to see the anti-collision analysis on the, bottom, uh, on the bottom side of this uh, plot. There is also a geomechanical analysis running on the back interconnected to the 1D and the 3D MEM that give you the quality of the mud window, breakouts, breakthroughs, pore pressure and fracture gradient. And also, again, the idea is to better design the wells, to better place the wells and to ensure, for example, if we're working offshore, uh, we have limited space and, and the slots are just fixed in surface, to select which is the slot that better achieve the targets. Even though that it might be the longest route, it might be that is the fastest to drill. 
So again, and again, just because uh, I was mentioning the geomechanical analysis, here in the screen you see the interconnectivity. And again, very simple traffic-like system telling you green, everything is okay, so your ECD and ESD is within the breakout, breakthrough margins. Yellow, then you are getting inside that Wilbur stability defined window. Or red, you are just outside port pressure, fracture gradient. Again, if you hover your mouse, the system will tell you where exactly, how much is your margin, and what is the recommended changes to actually get out of that problem, still hitting the target, still reaching your uh, TD. You see on the far right, then the plot for the full mod window. And again, as soon as you change something in the system, the MEM is automatically recomputed on the back in the system uh, with the new trajectory and the new details for you to project the latest and most accurate version. If we then uh, consider kick tolerance is something that uh, is normally done using Excel, uh, then why not to include uh, the transient simulation to then accrue for full distribution of the fluids and the thermodynamic effects that are affecting those fluids. It's not the same to consider one box full of gas, which is the single bubble model, moving in or out of the well, uh, depending on your circulation conditions, to assume that the gas will dissolve uh, within the MOD system, will have an effect on the compressibility of the system, if you're talking about oil-based MODs, and etc. So those are the conditions that we are now able to uh, accrue for. You have full sensitivity analysis, capabilities, you can make your uh, specific criteria and design for the circulation processes and methods, still in compliance with international regulations, in this case dictated by the IWCF. At last but not least, uh, the well barrier definition, very important in many locations around the world. This is automatically done by the system based on your activity sequencing. It's sort to say you are going to drill your uh, next section, so you are going to pick up your VHA, and start drilling from X to Z, then circulate the hole, and then the system will automatically recognize and give you that drawing of the, um, the barrier definitions. Activity versus um, activity curves, and in, in, in terms of uh, time and depth, uh, everything is automatically pre-populated for you based on your activity sequencing, which is following your specific activity um, templates. You can customize and change as required. And again, the times are taken from the template as a starting case, but all the times whenever possible reading from your observable data will be actually then read and uh, accounted for those MPTs or risks that we have included using the Monte Carlo simulation to give you the P10, P50, P90 curves. So you at the end have three curves and you can decide or select which is the one to use for the AFE calculation. All these elements have then uh, been engineered in a way to create an object. And this is what we call um, dynamic displayed item, DDI, which are subsequently passed into a smart reporting system that is embedded within the solution. That smart reporting system is allowing us then to, with one click button, automatically create a full drilling program. And what I mean with that is what we normally take three, five, seven, ten days to compile as a full report, maybe 20, 30, 200 pages, you name it, uh, with all the details, all the images, all the plots, all the BHAs, all the product sheets from the different providers. Now the system can do it in a few seconds. In the worst case scenario, uh, as an example, I can give you uh, from experience, 200 pages full of images. It took around 20 minutes to get compiled by the system, so it's enough time to actually go out, take a coffee, go for a smoke, come back, and then you have your report ready to go. Uh, and again, it will match your standards, your compliance. It doesn't matter who is actually creating that report. You will have 100% compliance to your templates, no matter what. At last but not least, I want to give you a, a good example how this solution has been used so far. Two good examples of this, ExxonMobil and OMB. Uh, one in the U.S. corporate headquarters and the other one close to us here in Europe. Uh, Exxon actually decided to implement this solution late last year, and uh, it has been rolled out initially in their unconventional operations in the U.S. because they are drilling close to 300, 400 wells on a yearly basis pre-corona situation. 
their um, main goal was to increase the efficiency, the procedural adherence, and the consistency all across the well construction planning. What way they wanted to agree at the end, or to achieve at the end, was to reduce the planning cycle by something around 80 to 90 percent. In the OMB case, they have started to use the solution earlier this year, international operations except Romania, and uh, they plan, uh, because this is a phase rollout, is, as you can see in the screen, by 2022, reduce the planning cycle by 90%. That means they will be able to plan one well, full compliance, let's say, in the North Sea, Norwegian uh, North Sea, one of the most critical and, and challenging conditions that exist in the world because of the specific requirements, in about one week. Many other locations, and you can see the map in the center, uh, is, are using this uh, specific solution. And again, many different clients are profiting from this uh, kind of collaborative solution to remote, um, to enable the remote working, especially in these times when we cannot meet, uh, meet physically in the office, especially when internet connectivity is then allowing us to, for example, perform this uh, fantastic conference remotely, even though that it would be better if we could actually then share a coffee together afterwards. But, you know, this is the new reality and this is where we want to go. This is what we can achieve nowadays and the technology is there to be used. As a conclusion, again, I just want to give you some highlights. Uh, so digital backend integration, everything is built on microservices and that means it's by far more agile, simple to correct if uh, any enhancement needs to be pushed or any bug is found. It's very simple to manage, very simple to adjust. Directly orchestrated around the well design, you have to cover everything that is in your standards. You can then change or adjust as you require, customize as much as you need. The data integration saves a huge amount of time for all the engineers. And of course, it integrates the deep automated learning processes and machine recognition, machine learning recognition algorithms. The digital enforcement of the company policies is at the highest standard possible. It incorporates the procedures and the automatic selection of a specific criteria for design, uh, for material selection, for example, or the casing well geometry is another one that can be predefined. One click report, as I was saying, enables reduction of weeks of work in, in some cases or several days. From the benchmark worldwide uh, as of now, this solution has been able to reduce by at least 50% of the planning time. That means freeing up of the time of the engineers to do engineering analysis. And at the end, what we want to really do is to promote that collaboration. Doesn't matter if we are in Portugal or where I am just now, home in Norway. Many other people around the world can be working in the same, collaborating in the same solution without any discrepancy, without any disruption. With this, I thank you very much for your time and I am open for questions. Very much, thank you very much for, for this great presentation. Uh, I have a few questions and maybe some in the room also. So if I understand correctly, so this is a kind of dead fee phase two, isn't it? This is actually, Delphi is the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. Drill plan is the solution, is the name of the solution. I did not mention it, but uh, that is the name. And it's actually the very first native Delphi application that has been built, and it was launched back in 2017. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I remember to have been a participant to the ISIS event in, in Paris where this uh, Delphi integration yeah. was presented. So exactly, that's exactly. It was at the SIR forum back in Paris, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, there's a question I have is, is if you don't have in, any data at all, let, let assume that I would drill in a, in a well, a well, an exploration well in a very remote area. So I, I don't have data or my amount of data is very limited. So, but maybe I can find something in rush more or maybe somewhere else. Uh, how, how does we, how that could work? Because your example, for example, would be fantastic, for example, for the pre-sort uh, that uh, uh, we're working on, uh, where we have more than 100 wells. So you have to, uh, you have, have, if I have to plan my 100-01 well, I can use that, I can do it very quick. 
But what about exploration where, where I don't have much data and how you will handle this kind of situation with this interface? Fantastic question. Uh, in reality, the system is very robust as well on that side because as part of the Delphi capabilities, we can interconnect with the different public databases. And even though that we, you might be on an exploration well on a very remote area, there is always some data that is available, either from the ministries of oil on the specific countries or from your vicinity, from your partners, from other operators that can either make that data available to you as part of the licenses and agreement or the government where you are, or from your vicinity, from your partners, from other operators that can either make that data available to you as part of the licenses and agreement or the government where you are going to drill that will be made that data available as a basin or at a basin level. Part of the Delphi integration allows you then to quickly search that data. It doesn't matter if you are only 10 kilometers away or a thousand kilometers away, the data will render available to you on a seamlessly manner anyway. So even on exploration, you actually can benefit from those kind of analysis for the observed wells. Okay, okay, great. Okay, uh, I have two questions from, from the room. Is One of them is, can I use a non submerged application to name it one of your competitors or also a, a drilling suite? Uh, can your system also could work with a, a competition uh, application? Indeed, again, another good question. Part of the vision that we have created around all this environment and in particular with the solution is that we are, no matter what, vendor agnostic, vendor neutral. If you want to bring data, for example, on the trajectory design, which is one of the most common elements or questions that I always get, because it's normally done by my competitor uh, drilling suite solution, uh, we can easily utilize that file that has been exported from that solution. Again, we're talking about a standalone solution, bring it here and then interconnect it here throughout the end-to-end -end cycle. Moving forward, there are several companies uh, that are working on the next generation as well, uh, creating a specific modules or a specific routines to actually then be deployed in the cloud. As long as they are on the cloud, we can easily interconnect as well via APIs. Otherwise, uh, we can develop a specific API to connect to a standalone solution that resides on your computer and then stream the data bidirectionally between the two without any problem. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Okay, the, the last question I have, I think I cannot phone anymore uh, during the time is 1627, is um, we, we are GARP also, we have what, what we call a wet debris process with wet gate. So we have the scoping phase, the design phase, the planning phase, and the execution phase. Is it something also you can integrate in this platform about establishing some, some phases with some gate? Okay, to accomplish this gate, I need to achieve this, this, and this, and this. And then you have all the green light, like you were showing us a bit earlier, in order to move to next, uh, to next scope or to the next gate. Is it something also you can insert in, in your interface? Indeed, as part of the orchestrated planning, uh, when I show you early in the presentation the subsurface and engineering elements, you can then customize that to say gate one, concept selection, gate two, concept definition, gate three, etc. Okay. Uh, and then for each one of these gates, you will have a specific boxes, which are a every single task that needs to be done to actually get through the gate uh, decision planning stage at the end, the meeting, and one click button again, and you can fully automate the reporting that goes with that gate. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about a drilling report in a specific, it can be just one page summary with all the details specific to those tasks from that gate uh, process. And then uh, you can customize it as much as you want for sure. And uh, more importantly, yes, you can uh, utilize the system. We are working with a couple of clients just now to fully replace their project management feature in one case. And in the other, we are actually interconnecting the solution with their um, project planning uh, architecture at corporate level that will directly link and interface uh, the specific task that needs to be accrued by any uh, individual during the gate decision planning process. Okay. Okay, great. Vladimir, 
I hope I pronounced this, this time your name correctly, Vladimir. Thank oh, you yes. so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us during this half an hour. Thank you so much for this great technology. Uh, I can I clearly see the, 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 the value for, for it and, uh, and thank you very much for your time and your valuable uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the fight. Stay safe away. Stay safe in Norway and away from the cold as much as you can. And uh, <laughs> stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Cheers. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, this technology is fantastic. We just uh, leave somebody. Yeah, I can see somebody else on my screen, which I think is uh, Mr. Nick Hunbach, if I pronounce your name correctly. Nick, I'm sure. Hunbach, maybe less sure. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. <laughs> okay. Uh, from from Icon. So I, I'm pretty happy to receive Icon because Icon, well, Gat Gap is working with Icon quite frequently. Not myself, but some folks. Uh, Upstairs from the Geo Solution Department, we have used uh, Icon for a couple of projects. So I'm very happy uh, to 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 receive Icon. And um, so again, uh, your name is uh, Nick and Batch. And uh, Nick, you joined I think Icon Science in 2008, and uh, you are the product manager for QI application. And uh, during uh, your time in Icon, uh, you had various positions through software support, senior geo scientist, a team leader with a quantitative interpretation QI team, and as a technical sales manager for Europe and Africa. Uh, you received a master degree in geology in 2007 and another master in remote sensing 2008 from UCL. And I think we will spend the next uh, 30 minutes together about talking yet another dry hole. So, yes, indeed. Nick, yes. welcome. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me clearly and see my slides. Um, so, uh, yes, so my talk today is um, regarding um, how we can uh, basically use the digital transformation initiative that we're seeing in the industry uh, in recent years, how we can uh, use that to basically uh, avoid drilling another dry hole. So the focus here is very much on the use of a uh, the use of the um, changing of focus in the industry to more digital technologies, let's say, but actually their practical um, uh, meaning in terms of how do we actually avoid uh, these dry holes, and when we're evaluating prospects, um, how do we do that in a more sensible manner? So, um, you know, very clearly, we just have three things to look at. We have to have a look at our aims and the rationale for what we're trying to do uh, using the so-called digital transformation. Um, we need to look at where we are today um, and, and certainly then use that information that we can see at the current state of, state of play um, and see if we can improve matters going forward. So if we begin with a, a headline statistic, um, this is actually back from uh, from back in 2017 um, from a report by the World Economic Forum on Digital Transformation Initiative. Um, and it's uh, basically estimating over the next decade or the decade from 2017 um, that there'll be this uh, top line figure of uh, $1.6 trillion of, of value um, gained from a, a digital transformation in our industry. And, um, you know, those kind of um, top line figures are, are interesting. Um, and, you know, they've been presented, of course, by many people in the past. Um, but I do think they are useful um, as they grab attention and they focus us on the topic. But actually, on the practical side of things, um, we still have the question, um, how do we realize that promise? Um, so given, you know, this is back in 2017, um, well, how are we doing today? Now we're in 2020. So, you know, I think it's definitely worth stating at the beginning that um, if we want to think about digital transformation in our industry, we should be uh, the people who are in a good position. You know, given that the complexity of our challenge, um, which is, of course, to find and produce hydrocarbons, given that that is a very complex challenge, we've always had to be at the forefront of technology and innovation.
So picking up new initiatives, new ways of working going forward um, should be kind of second nature to us. And at the same time, we already, you know, do big data, you know, seismic surveys, flow simulations, um, and it's and even even more so, you know, the fact is that the amount of data that we generate um, from our activities is more or less becoming a liability for us. You know, there's a nice quote there at the bottom, uh, you know, a single drilling rig can generate terabytes of data every day, but only a small fraction of it is actually used for decision making. So that's the, you know, that gets to the heart of the matter. Yes, data, of course, and the amount of data is part of it, but um, we actually need to make sure that that data is used for decision making. Um, so, you know, we we uh, we we have challenges to face, and we and we have always been good at uh, addressing those challenges. You know, um, harsh conditions, um, many kilometres of depth to access and, and produce hydrocarbons. Um, but uh, you know, we need to we need to understand that the data we we collect is it the right data? What's happened to it previously? What's its provenance? So it's not just about throwing data at the problem. It's about using the correct data, but also gaining knowledge from that data and, and ultimately using it to improve our decision making. Um, so a couple of uh, other um, statistics to kind of um, capture hopefully where we are today. Um, so this is kind of a, from a, a global perspective, where are we? Um, we need to basically, you know, if we take these charts here, so these are well success rates. Um, so the top left there is um, technical success rate as those line plots, and you've got the, um, uh, the size of discoveries, um, commercial, non-commercial, and dry holes. Um, these are particularly focused for for stratigraphic traps, but it's kind of taking the bigger picture, and you can see that globally there's been a general increase in the um, commercial success rates, the CSRs, over the last few years. Um, and then in the bottom right there, you've got um, the um, average lead time from first investment decision to, on, to, to coming on stream and the average uh, project payback. So, you know, if you take a very um, uh, broad overview, you can see that maybe, you know, our success rates are generally um, coming up and maybe we're becoming, uh, generally speaking, more efficient. And, um, you know, ultimately, we have lost people and skills from the industry over the uh, years that we're looking at here. And, and in a general sense, resources have become restricted. So, you know, given that the digital transformation should allow us to do uh, more with less, if you like, um, you know, improve our decision making, perhaps what we're seeing here is um, that it is kicking in, that we're starting to be more efficient with the way we work to use our data uh, more effectively. If we look at um, more detailed level, so this is now particularly focusing on Norway and the UK, um, the picture is less clear. So here we're plotting um, in the upper row, so the, each column, the left column is for Norway, the right for the UK, and the, uh, the line charts there are the technical success rates. Um, you know, um, basically we can see that they're, in a general sense, I should say pretty good, being around the 50% mark. And that's, you know, really a function of the fact that those are mature basins and quite a mature industry in those countries. But what we really, what really is interesting to me, at least, is that for the last two decades for either country, um, we've not really seen any systematic improvement in technical success rate. So, you know, nothing has really changed. Um, in the lower row there for each country, the yellow dots are the commercial success rates. Um, and we can see from the scatter in those points that you know, it's pretty variable. Um, there's no systematic increase in the commercial success rates over the years. Um, so basically, you know, how do we change this? How do we move the needle, if you like? Can we can we use this idea of the digital transformation to improve these success rates? Um, because, you know, ultimately what we need to do is, is to see a, an improvement in these statistics um, and a base in the level, the country level, kind of uh, in terms of the details. So, you know, a list, if you just uh, Google or have a look uh, uh, on the internet um, to see the recent exploration news, you'll, you'll obviously see plenty of, uh, unfortunately, plenty of failures uh, out there. And, and really, um, you know, there's not a lot to add here other than to suffice to say that there's still too many of these failures. 
And and actually, if you dig into individual um, uh, cases, uh, the reasons for those failures become all too clear. Um, so basically, we have strong motivation to change the way we work. Um, it's when we look at the details of each failure, what went wrong, um, that's when we get motivated to change things, to change how we work. So, you know, those big headline numbers are great, but it's the details of each individual failure that guide our change or our change in approach. Now, if I go back to that um, World Economic Forum uh, Digital Transformation Initiative report, that's actually got um, some interesting conclusions in there, and, and these are four of them. And I've, I've put them up here because I think they're very important, um, and they serve as a, a guide to how we, sh we could or should address the challenges we face and, and how we might actually uh, go on to reduce those failure rates. So, you know, number one, we need to obviously um, have that culture of innovation and technology adoption, uh, open up to new ways of working. Uh, we need to be able to scale up technology in these digital platforms. Of course, the, the data um, uh, part of it is key, but it's having that data architecture in place. Um, you know, of course, uh, using that data again to impact decisions is, is what we're trying to do. So we need to make sure that we use all the data that's available. We don't miss any. It doesn't get trapped in this idea of silos or knowledge sinks, if you like. Um, so, you know, as I say, these, these should basically, um, I think, guide us in our, in our working in terms of this uh, digital transformation. And, and the bottom one there, this idea of deepening collaboration is, is key. And I hope to illustrate that in a few slides time, um, this idea of integration between disciplines. So, you know, of course, technology will always be a key aspect of our industry. Um, you know, and, what te and the technology which is relevant will vary from challenge to challenge. Um, but it, that technology can't be used in a vacuum on its own. It must uh, form part of a holistic approach. Um, and that really aligns with those conclusions that we saw in the last slide. You know, we have to remember our mission statement uh, for this idea of digital transformation, and that is to positively impact decisions with data-driven knowledge. And that's different, fundamentally different from either throw more data at the problem or use a silver bullet technology as it will solve all of your uh, your issues or your problems. And, you know, if you're if anyone's familiar with uh, the software, the RockDoc software that we provide at Icon, you'll be aware that we do enjoy or like a bit of technology. But, you know, we've always said it has to be the right technology at the right time and it has to feed into all other aspects of the of subsurface prediction, basically. So I think it's um, helpful to actually think. So I think it's um, helpful to actually think if we are looking at prospect evaluation um, to set out exactly the different disciplines, or in a very general sense, that are, are involved. Um, you know, and each of those, of course, is very, has a very important role to play. But there has to be interaction between disciplines, um, a better interaction between disciplines, if we're to see improvements in these um, success rates. So, you know, an obvious one is the interaction between geology and geophysics. Um, and we'll have a look at some case studies in a minute, but um, that disconnect between those two disciplines can, can give us issues. Um, so we need to make sure that we um, iterate between them and can we use digital transformation to facilitate this integration? So if you, um, you know, do a quick literature review and see uh, the various uh, things, uh, reports that are out there on, um, on, on uh, you know, post well analysis, uh, analyses or dry hole studies, if you like, um, fundamentally, geological problems account for 97 point or the, the vast majority of them, depending on exactly which report you're looking at. But essentially, you know, it's key geological concepts, which tend to be the problem, so lack of a trap, seal, and reservoir, and that's noted in in many reports. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it's a pretty consistent message across these reports. If we uh, focus in on one of those studies, this is a 2015 post well analysis for the uh, Murray Firth and Central North Sea um, UK continental shelf. Um, the most surprising statistic that really stood out to me from this report is that. In over a third of cases, the main risk was not predicted pre-drill, um, which I would say is surprising to say the least. Um, and if we look further 
uh, we can see that in almost 40% of cases, there wasn't just uh, one thing that was not predicted or one problem, it was for three clear causes. And again, back to this trap or seal, lack of those things and absent reservoir. Um, you know, and that to me is a clear indication that a significant number of these prospects were not drill ready. Um, you know, and of course, there are reasons why they're drilled, commitment, etc. But, you know, we're talking about big, um, big uh, proportions of those prospects just having some what's on, you know, post drill seems to be a fairly obvious problem. Um, what's not being picked up pre drill. If we look at the conclusions from that same report, um, you know, I've included it because it aligns with what those conclusions on the digital transformation effort from that World Economic Forum report. Um, you know, and even indeed for our own plan for digital transformation, you know, we need peer review collaboration. We need that holistic approach where you have an integration between geology and geophysics. Um, and we need to have um, improved access to all of the relevant data. Um, and we want to also lo uh, make sure that we, we we reduce, let's say, the potential for knowledge loss. So this is an interesting quote from the conclusions there about people changing posting or company. And, you know, that's a very obvious way that, that, that knowledge is lost. So here, particularly focusing on individual prospects um, and what you end up with is disconnect in the analyses. So what's ICON's digital vision then going forward? Well, really, it's actually more of a digital reality, um, given that we're releasing our ecosystem later this year. Um, this, what we see in the slide here, is a high-level schematic of that vision. So it's a process-driven um, approach um, with integration between disciplines, all backed by knowledge and, and knowledge capture. So the idea is that you bring in data into the system, um, and that can come from a wide variety of sources. Um, you understand what that data is, as in what, where's it come from, what are the uncertainties associated with it. Um, you aggregate and cleanse and direct that data. And once it's in the system, then all disciplines, uh, geology, geophysics, but also other disciplines, are all aware of the data that's available and what's been done to it, uh, what the uncertainties are. Um, and then that knowledge, as it builds, can flow through the system and it isn't lost or stuck in silos, um, as, as often happens uh, with today's um, geoscientific software setup, if you like, that particular um, you know, outputs or products get um, lost or, or stuck in a particular software system, or you know, we don't understand what work was done or the uncertainties associated, the assumptions. But if we can come into an ecosystem, a shared environment where we can um, ensure connection between each process, we should start to avoid some of the problems that were highlighted in that report. So to illustrate that a bit more, we can focus in on, uh, you know, in particular, uh, amplitude analysis, seismic amplitude analysis, much as was done in those in those reports for each of those prospects. Um, so how do we uh, how do we do that correctly? Well, to understand seismic amplitudes, we must do first the rock physics analysis. Uh, rock physics being, of course, the connection between geology and geophysics, um, and we've already identified that as being key. You know, I'm making sure we understand the geological risks um, present. And of course, we need to do the well tie, which is linking our uh, well-based, um, well control responses to the seismic. Um, so, you know, we can have a quick think and easily list the different disciplines and data types that flow into each of these um, steps. Um, and, you know, already we can see a lot of connectivity between these disciplines, um, both in terms of those that are considered geology and those that are considered geophysics. So, you know, there's a lot of disciplines that are feeding into this. So lots of knowledge coming from each discipline, which we need to pick up and pass through. And equally on the right there, um, once we've done that prospect evaluation or seismic amplitude analysis, um, you know, we might obviously look at where we're going to place our well. We might update our seismic interpretation or do things like pore pressure prediction. And equally, those things can come back and iterate round. So, you know, if you have a new well, for example, you update your rock physics analysis to improve your understanding of the uh, of the connection to the seismic. 
Um, if you have poor pressure predictions going into there, that will also impact the inputs to rock physics and the rock physics itself. So there's always that um, re requirement, let's say, to iterate. You know, new well data should come in and make our system evergreen rather than just uh, moving on and being ignored if it's a failure. You know, in those cases, often that data is ignored. Um, whereas actually what we want to do is learn from our mistakes and update our framework. So we need to, you know, answer those questions at the bottom there. What are the right inputs? Not just not just what are, you know, ticket off on the list, which are the right ones to use, which is the right petrophysical interpretation or the right uh, elastic logs if, uh, for this case. And where do they live? How do we get access to them? Um, you know, and is the work, is the value that my work is uh, generated, is that being realized? You know, is my, uh, depending what it is, if it, is my work on the rock physics being actually used in the uh, um, amplitude analysis or is it being ignored? Um, and next, we'll have a look at some examples of why, um, again, why we need to make sure that that value is being realized. Um, you know, and using the type of system that I described in the last slide um, can, can answer those questions for us. So very quickly, just to have a look at some of the particular examples of um, ha capturing knowledge and using it in prospect evaluation in particular, for this case in particular. If we think about things like compaction states, that's a basin-wide process that impacts seismic amplitudes. You know, you might get under compaction, um, giving you soft responses in the seismic. But if we don't um, understand that in the context of uh, our uh, seismic amplitude uh, interpretation in the given basin, then we might decide actually let's drill those soft responses because maybe they relate to hydrocarbons. You know, should we do that? Um, and if we had this knowledge here, uh, the answer would be of course, of course not without caution because, for example, in your basin maybe you are seeing under compaction for brine sands, giving us a kind of a false positive. In terms of uh, another example, um, you know, uh, in this case, often people drill low VPVS ratio responses um, as hydrocarbon anomalies. Um, but in this particular basin on the left here, this is a cross plot of VPVS ratio versus shale content. You'll see that actually the um, lowest VPVS ratio uh, responses for this particular these particular rocks are the actual slightly shaly sands. So again, with that knowledge. Um, uh, you would actually have to change your interpretation of the seismic and say, actually, we need to look at not just the VPVS ratio. On the right here, we have a cross plot of velocity versus porosity. And in those red ellipses are some overpressured um, sandstones. And again, those will give sight, uh, soft, bright, soft reflectors, um, which are as a function of overpressure. And again, if you didn't have that information, um, you might be tempted to drill those reflectors. Um, so again, if we if we if we lose this information or this knowledge, let's say from the system, it doesn't impact our um, prospect analysis, and we therefore open ourselves up to the potential for failure. So just before I conclude the talk, um, let's have a look at a couple of interesting market surveys um, which are out there, um, easy to find. So the one on the right there is from 2017, and the one on the left is, is actually from last year. But interestingly, they both give the same result. Um, when we're asked, how do we feel as an industry? Um, how do we feel we're doing in terms of uh, digital maturity? You know, how much are we actually um, getting from new digital technologies? Um, we feel that we are lagging behind other industries. Um, so for me, this suggests that we're aware, um, to some degree at least, that there are benefits to be had um, and, you know, that they could help us with the challenges that we've looked at very briefly today, but we, we don't feel that we've realised the potential yet. And that really goes back to that headline on the first page. We have those big numbers out there, the big potential, but unless we actually do something more practical, um, it's going to be very hard to realise um, that potential. Um, so, you know, we need to realise that the full potential of digital transformation really is a practical process-driven approach and it should be tailored given the challenges that we actually face day to day. So, you know, that concludes my talk. Um, there are clear challenges um, that the digital transformation can address and, um, you know, it's only by looking at more detailed um, cases of, of what we're trying to actually improve 
that we can actually design an approach to, to use that and to realize the potential. So we need a pragmatic approach that starts by looking at the challenges and then that allows us to be in a better place, um, better position to overcome them. And you know that is exactly the approach that we're taking at ICON. So that's the end of the talk. Um, if there are any questions, then, then please let me know. Nick, thank you very much for, for, for the great talk. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I start to be lost from the slide 17 because I'm a dreader. But yeah. a part of that, from 1 to 16, I understood almost everything, which is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> in, in matter of question, uh, I think I have one or two, maybe one or two from the room, and I think we still have some time because you are the last uh, speaker. Uh, okay. okay. Do, do, do you know if, if the uh, industry can first shorten the, 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 the life cycle, the project life cycle. You know, by, by the time we shoot seismic, at the time we have the first story, we, we took maybe uh, 10 years, okay? Mm. Do you think uh, we can reach a world from the time I shoot the seismic and uh, assuming that uh, the FP is already, I uh, don't take in consideration the uh, construction time for, for, the, for, for, for FPSO or for the production facility, I can have a project in five years. You, you can reduce the cycle by half. Hmm. So this is one question you can think about. And uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the other one I have, uh, that's maybe easier for you, you know, there are, for a company to make a decision about going to a project or not going to a project is a start. So we have a start, and uh, for example, I will give a, a stupid example, but sometimes it's happening. You have a, a, a P10 stripe of 5 billion barrels, and you have a P90 stripe of 300 million barrels. And in the middle, we have something at 2 billion. So, should I go to this business? How can I trust this business when I got a, a 5 billion delta between the P10 and the P90? How can I trust that? So, this is the second one. So, basically, this is already two questions that you can maybe give some, some feedback on. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I would say on your on the first point there, you know, it, it's obviously many aspects to how we can become more efficient. Um, you know, and part of that is technology. So it's things like if we're talking about seismic acquisition, is can we stream the data from the acquisition vessels to shore? You know, get that um, uh, much more quickly than than maybe we did in the past, and therefore you know use it um, in our decisions more quickly. So that's kind of a more straightforward technology part of it. Um, and, and again, you know, looking at um, if we can um, uh, integrate disciplines, you know, we don't want to go, let's do process A um, in, in kind of uh, on its own, you know, in, in a kind of vacuum and then move on to process B. We want to make sure almost that um, not really doing things in parallel, but they are very much running at the same time and integrating and iterating between them. So I think it's only, you know, given that really we're focusing on how can we actually change our way of working um it's only way when we use a system where we can actually be aware of what other disciplines are doing um that we can actually then start to drive efficiencies um you know in terms of the uncertainties on on these things of course there's always going to be uncertainty and that's driven by the geological processes and properties in the basin and the data that's available you know are you frontier or near field etc um but again if we're focusing on how do we change our way of working it's only, you know, comes kind of back to the same thing almost, that um, it's only within a system where we're aware of the work that's being done on each part to understand those uncertainties that are driving that wide delta, um, that we can actually understand the uncertainty that's been inherent in each step in the workflow and actually then at the end of it have a good idea of why do we have that delta? You know, why is there such a big disparity between those cases? Um, and if we can actually, rather than just, of course, know what it is, so we actually have an understanding of the the risk. Let's say um, we actually, hopefully, will be able to break it down and say, yes, part of that comes from the fact that the elastic properties are very similar. Therefore, the seismic isn't, of course, it, you know, it's non-unique anyway. But if it's a lot of overlap in the elastic properties, then there's a lot more uncertainty on the seismic. Um, but all all other disciplines as well, where we can actually just understand where does that uncertainty come from, and can we actually break it down into the individual disciplines and, and the only way you can really do that is if you're working in a uh, um, an ecosystem where you're aware of what other people are doing what other disciplines are doing and and taking that into account as you do your work 
So, you know, it's it's going to be a, a challenge that's um, case by case, challenge by challenge, if you like. But we need to just be um, more aware of um, all of the different things which are going on when we're trying to make predictions in the subsurface and, and make sure that we're, um, yes, using the right technology and data, but also doing things collaboratively. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully it gives you some kind of uh, expansion on, on our ideas, at least. No, no, no. Definitely, uh, Nick. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I've got two more questions. So the room I have about 40 people, which is a good number. And, uh, and there's two questions. Uh, the one, do you think during this way we reach a point that any study will come with a POS uh, 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 chance of success above 30%? For example, so this is one. <laughs> the second one is okay. You have the big data. You have a gigabyte of data. My dream, my uh, my inspiration, where I got a commercial success. How can we reduce the amount of appraisal wells, which is quite expensive? If you have a very strong model, a very strong case, your expression well is matching exactly your expectation. Why why can we? cannot go straight to to development phase instead of doing two, three, four, five appraisal well just to confirm your expectation. Yeah, um so on the second one, you know, it's 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 not I guess so straightforward because it will be again case by case given, you know, um the geological complexity that you're dealing with, um and again, you know, how much data you've got, you know, if you, it's it's understanding the problem. Um so, yes, I mean, of course, we would like to uh, reduce that amount of time we spend doing appraisal, but it's it's one of those things that um, uh, if you have a highly, you know, complex um, architecture of your reservoir, you, you, it's just going to require more appraisal wells. Um, but, um, you know, it does come back to, to having, as you say, this strong model of what's going on. And, and again, you know, just making sure that you have all the different inputs um, coming in into to inform that model, all the different uh, disciplines and the data um, coming into it. Um, so I think the key point really is, as I was trying to allude to in my in my presentation, is the yes, data is part of it certainly. Um, and there's a lot of talk about big data these days and using AI or machine learning to crunch through that data. But we believe that um, it's not just a case of throwing data at it. And indeed, actually, that can be counterproductive in that. If the um, kind of lose that connection to physics, if you like, um, you know, the data quality um, is not good enough or we don't actually understand what the data means in terms of what it's responding to or its uncertainty, then just blindly um, applying those kind of big data techniques of machine learning and AI isn't going to be helpful, actually. Um, so it's more about having the connection to the physics of what's going on, but again, understanding um, the different uncertainty levels and where the assumptions are coming from and what actually are the biggest risks you know is it again as we saw in those reports is it is it because of uh, you know lateral seal or whatever it is for a particular challenge but can we actually flag that and make sure it's kind of um pulled through the workflow in terms of knowledge flow you know the the success rates again it's as as we saw in the in the slides it's going to vary very much on a, a basin by basin or challenge by challenge basis Technical success rates, um, you'd hopefully like to see those improve. Um, obviously, the commerciality of uh, individual prospects, uh, et cetera, is going to depend on many other things. Um, so, you know, are we uh, are we going to be in a position to systematically see that increase? I um, think that if we can start with those um, problems that we see highlighted in those reports, the reports from, you know, a few years ago and even real things that in hindsight, um, fairly straightforward, you know, uh, things which uh, which uh, this, that they shouldn't have, you know, maybe truncated a map or interpreted on the wrong horizon or whatever it is. Um, it, so I, I think there are definitely some uh, easy wins, if you like, in terms of um, actually being aware. Easy wins, if you like, in terms of um, actually being aware of um, what what's being done, the data is, uh, uncertainty assumptions, and, and making sure there's. Uh, collaboration and peer review throughout the whole process. So it's hard to say yes or no to that, but I think the only way we're going to be able to um, improve those success rates is via um, ensuring collaboration and ensuring we have the right data and that we actually build on the knowledge rather than doing things in a disconnected manner. 
Nick, thank you, thank you very much for 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 your reply and your thoughts about this. And uh, I guess we're coming end to to our session. I would like to thank uh, you personally, Nick and Icon, for being part of the, this uh, great event. We have been a uh, part of this uh, afternoon together. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, maybe uh, well first I, w I wish you all the best and uh, stay safe. And I hope uh, we have the opportunity to talk again. And man, um, now I think I will let uh, Natalia uh, for the last word uh, to close uh, our Thursday afternoon session. Natalia? Yeah, so we have finished the first day of presentations into the room number two of the seventh gallery. We would like to thank you all for attending the event and for the very interesting presentation. Mm -hmm.